Good morning, uh, Ferris Park Baptist Church. I bring greetings in the name of Jesus from my family and myself. Uh, really honored and uh, thankful that the elders have invited me to uh, share with you some insights upon my own life. And uh, basically, I, today I come to you <coughs> uh, wanting to share with you about the biblical principles. Uh. So first and foremost, uh, the Bible says that all scriptures are, is God breath and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You know? So this morning I would like to share with you on the topic of how should we live our life. Uh, we will learn some spiritual lesson using the biblical principles. And uh, today, I just want to highlight to you about four points. Lah, all right? Number one is the futility of wealth. We must always trust in God, never in our riches. Lah. Number two is the danger of overconfidence. Number three is the fine line between life and death. And number four is the danger of doing nothing. All right? So to illustrate these points, lah, I will use some insights from an incident about a very famous ocean liner. And the historic event and the ocean liner has been made in several movies. Uh. And of course, the most famous one was none other than the Academy Award winner, the Titanic. Okay? Uh, Philip Franklin, the vice president of the White Star Line in New York, made the announcement of the sinking of the ship on the 14th of April 1912. The sinking of the biggest passenger ship ever built at that time resulted in the death of more than 1,500 people of the 2,208 passengers on board. I have done some research on the ocean liner, right? And uh, I've also done, uh, I, read, I read and watch the National Geographic. And I also listened to the interview of James Cameron. James Cameron is very famous uh, because he's the one that directed and produced the movie Titanic. And before he did the movie, he himself had done a very insightful, uh, in-depth uh, learning as well as uh, research onto this uh, Titanic. In fact, uh, he actually uh, put together some submarines and go underneath to the sunken ship to have a look at the ship itself uh, because he wanted to, to learn more in terms of what actually happened to the ship itself. And uh, for that reason, right, I have the chance to learn from him and also learn from the survival of the accounts on what happened that night uh, through the Google. The one thing about this trage tragedy, right, it interests a lot of people. Wh why is it so? It is because, according to Wikipedia, there are 168 ocean liner listed as maritime disasters in the 20th century, but none is as infamous as uh, Titanic. And the major loss of life itself, over 1,500 over people died that night, mainly from hypothermia because of the freezing water, remain one of the greatest number of deaths in a non-military transportation accident up to that time. And uh, one thing I want to share is also the amazing character of this ship. It was the largest ship of that day. You know? The size is huge as long as a three football field. And it has 10 different decks. 10 decks. Can you imagine the ship at that time? We have 10 decks. Of course, the current ocean liner, like the, Carib like the Caribbean, right? Uh, it is probably uh, five times the size of the Titanic. But in 1912, uh, to have the size of three football field uh, for, a, uh, for an ocean liner uh, is actually remarkably huge. Uh. And it is also one of the fastest ships of the day. It was on its maiden voyage from Southampton, UK, to New York City. It was the most luxurious uh, so-called ocean liner ever built to be the pinnacle of comfort and luxury. It has gymnasium, swimming pool, it has libraries, it has high-class restaurants as well as a very opulent and luxurious uh, cabin. It was equipped with 20 lifeboats for only 1,178 people. And the reason why if have only 20 lifeboats for 1,170 people because they think that this ship cannot be sunk. So, the amazing coincidences that contributed to the tragedy, numerous details, any one of which, uh, if it had happened differently, would have prevented the ship 
Titanic from sinking or prevented so many losses of lives that night. Uh. Num- number one is the ship sailing has been postponed for three weeks. Uh. Had she sailed any other time, that iceberg uh, would not have been there. If the ship had travelled one mile per hour faster or slower, the iceberg would have been in a different position. The iceberg was blue in colour, therefore it was the most difficult kind to see. And the night was itself was moonless, uh, so no light actually to show the existence of the iceberg on the pathway of the ship. Uh. And the night was windless. Because the night was windless, like wind if there is a wind, right, wind would have made waves to splash on the iceberg, making it more visible. But unfortunately, on that night, it was windless. And men in the crow nest, right, those people who are on the watch out one, uh, crow nest, they do, they do not have a lookout glasses. Why? Because it was being mi- misplaced. Can you imagine? They have the glasses to look out at night to see what is happening. But unfortunately, they misplaced uh, that particular uh, glasses. Even so, the crew saw the iceberg in time to begin turning. If the crew had seen the iceberg 10 seconds sooner, the ship would have missed it, right? And the other amazing coincidences is that if the crew had seen the iceberg 10 seconds later, they would have hit the head, the ship would have hit the iceberg head on and causing damage which would not have sunk the ship itself. The ship sank because it grazed the berg, because they were turning, right? So it grazed the berg, slicing open the long section of the side of the ship itself. And that is the reason why it sunk. The ship could carry over 3,000 people, but it has a lifeboat for only 1,178. And that was the law at that time that requires that numbers. And even so, only 700 people actually went into the lifeboat itself. You know, the, la- the rest was in the water. That's why so many people died that night. And recent interest in the tragedy uh, has been stirred up by the fact that the wreckage was found and explored underwater in the 80s. Uh. Perhaps the greatest cause of interest is the ship sank on the very first voyage, despite the fact that many people believe to be unsinkable. So today, the biblical truth that we are looking at uh, is very much to be illustrated from the sinking of the Titanic itself. So, number one is the futility of wealth. Don't trust in our riches, alright? And the facts about Titanic is that it's the most luxurious ship that was very incredible. No such ship has been built in that, at that time, in that particular year. It, it was the first class accommodation that rivaled the best or the finest hotel on shore. The first class dining hall itself can accommodate 500 people in just one room. Can you imagine the size and the magnificence on the awesomeness of it? And the greatest showpiece was the, was the grand staircase, uh, which ascended four decks. Uh. That's why if you watch the movie Titanic by James Cameron, right, he tried to replicate the actual staircase itself. Uh. How magnificent is that staircase? Uh, you know? And the cost of one-way passage uh, in this, the finest suite, uh, with equate to ninety five thousand eight hundred and sixty US dollar in today's money, that's how expensive the uh, tickets is uh, for one final suite. Ninety eight, ninety five thousand eight hundred and sixty US dollar. Can you imagine? The passenger included some of the world's greatest millionaires in that ship itself. Uh, many millionaires was on that particular ship on that first voyage out of Southampton. And the man who designed the ship, he himself was on board, but he died. So what can we learn? Huh? In life, huh, wealth has its advantages, but in death, right, we are all equal. Whether we are millionaires or stowaways, you know, in the liner, those that died a freezing chilly death died the same. And I recall in the book of Ecclesiastes 5.15, right, we all come to the end of our life as naked, and empty-handed as on the day we were born. We can't take our riches with us. Likewise, no amount of money can ultimately prevent a man's death. When a rich man dies, he lives just like the poorest man who ever lived. That's what we are. Naked we come, naked we go. And uh, therefore, God warns us uh, never ever to trust in riches. Uh, you can't bring your riches with and neither can you 
with your riches buy a place in heaven. In 1 Timothy 6, 17-19, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly give us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this right, they will be storing up their treasures as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. This is what the Bible says. Uh. So if you are rich, do not hoard your money in the bank. Use your money. Ask the Holy Spirit what does the Lord wants you to do your, to use your money, to, your, to use your riches for. Do not hoard your money. All right? Matthew 16, 26 says, For what profit is the man if he gains the whole world, but then he loses his own soul, right? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? So money cannot buy you and me a place in heaven. When we face Jesus in judgment, right? What matters will be how we live our life, not how much we were worth. What is your goal in life? Do you live as though this world is the most important? Or are you living so that you'll be ready for the day you die? When you meet Jesus, when he asks you the questions, did you do what I asked you to do? And if you, if you don't have the answer for him, then you and I, we are in big trouble. The danger of overconfidence. The facts about the Titanic. Many passengers and crew members believe uh, the Titanic to be unsinkable. Nobody ever thought that this ship can sink. It, it is the best, the best technology, the best architect, the best engineer that put together their minds and they build it they build and construct this particular ship for more than three years. And the ship designer himself believed it was almost true, you know, that this ship is unsinkable. One passenger asked a ship agent uh, for extra insurance on some valuable in her luggage. And the agent replied, ridiculous. Why you want to, you know, pay extra insurance for your, all these uh, valuables? This boat is unsinkable, he told the lady. After the ship has struck the iceberg, uh, a passenger asks you know, the, 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 the shippers if they should do something about it. And surprisingly, he replied, go back to bed. <laughs> this ship is unsinkable. And one passenger asked the dog hen, is this ship really unsinkable? The man replied, yes, my lady. God himself couldn't sink this ship. You know? So what can we learn? There is a danger of pride and faith in human achievements. Many today put so much faith in man's abilities that they do not realize their need for God. In our current pandemic, right, which is happening all over the world, every nation are affected, every city, every town is affected. Do we put our faith in God or do we put our faith in the vaccination? You know, if you put your faith in vaccination, you are going to be very disappointed because no amount of vaccination can protect you from this coronavirus, which you can't even see with your own eyes. Anyway, this coronavirus is not going to go away. We just have to learn to live with it. And the writer of Psalms 91, you know, reminded us again and again that our refuge and our safety comes from spending time with God. You know, surprisingly, uh, this Psalms 91 was written, you know, a few thousand years ago. Yet, yet, you know, the way he wrote Psalms 91, it is as though has preparing us to face this pandemic today. And surprisingly, there is no name to the writer of Psalms 91. But can you imagine God has prepared us by using him to write this Psalms 91? You know, if he did not listen to God, right, today this Psalms 91 will not be a blessing to us. But because he listened to the Holy Spirit, he put down this Psalms 91 verse by verse. And today Psalms 91 speak to us very clearly. And it's as though has he himself lived at that time, in that season, with that pandemic. Humanism says there is no force or intelligence on earth higher than mankind. We must solve our own problem, for there is no one else to solve them. Or they trust human learning. They believe in science and technology and psychology. They believe we can completely control our own destiny, our own world, and do anything we want de without depending on God. Sometimes all we have to do is to look at the fury of natural disasters. You know, we have earthquake, 
we have all kinds of calamity that hits our world today uh, and even like coronavirus uh, and we are we are so helpless you know without god at our side uh. And Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction, right? And a healthy spirit before a fall. And we are rem reminded again about Genesis 11, 4 to 9, where mankind wanted to build the Tower of Babel. You know, man sought to do great things without depending on God. They thought nothing can, nothing they proposed to do will be withheld from them. When man developed this kind of pride, right? And the non dependency on God. God will often teach us how to humble and how weak we really are. So don't, don't let us become to that kind of situation where God has to humble us. It is rather that we humble ourselves now, you know, knowing that we depend on God, knowing that we depend uh, not upon our talents and gifting, but upon Him. Deuteronomy 8, 17-18 says, You may say to yourself, My power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember, it is the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth, and so confirm His covenant with us. So God is the one who gives you the talents, the giftings. He is the one that gives you the ideas, and He is the one that gives you the ability to create wealth, to produce wealth. It is not from your own. Okay? The moment you think that you are, it is coming from your own, that is the time that you will face you know, calamity. James 1.17 says, God is the giver of every good and perfect gift. So that's why when you need wisdom, when you need ideas, when you need help, you call upon God. Don't depend on yourself. Sometimes when you look back at our lives, right, we are so thankful to God for every blessing. So let us not forget where our blessing come from. It is not just the fruit of our labor, but an open heaven for us and our children. Remember, the Bible says that seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and everything shall be added unto you. So seek God first. Spend time with Him. Every morning as you wake up, as you breathe the air, thank Him, you know, thank Him for all the things that He has done for you in the past. Remember and thank Him for the present and also praise Him and thank Him for the future for that is our God. The moment you open your eyes, spend time with Him, you know, read His word, read the Bible, meditate upon His word. You know, proclaim his word, speak out the words, you know, and you can change the environment, you can change yourself, you can transform yourself by doing that. Just as Jesus did every morning when he spent time with our Lord. Number three, the fine line between life and death. The facts about Titanic. The Titanic struck the iceberg shortly before midnight. Some passengers were asleep. Some many of them were still partying. You know why? They were having a great time. They were enjoying themselves. They were eating. They were dancing. They were doing all kinds of things. They were confident that life will, go, will, will continue to go on because the ship was unsinkable, you know. But the ship, the ship actually sank within less than two and a half hours. And it sank at 2.20 a.m. Many were still in their party clothes and some of them were in their pajamas. But many of them died that way. None expected to die that night, but many died that night. So what can we learn from this sinking of the Titanic? James 4, 13, 14 says, You do not know what will happen tomorrow, for life is like a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Job 14, 2 said, Man comes forth like a flower and fades away. He flees like a shadow and does not continue. Proverbs 27, 1 says that do not boast about tomorrow. For you do not know what a day may bring forth. So life, our life itself is very uncertain. We cannot tell what will happen tomorrow, right? We are, all no, we are only sure of the now and what we do now matters. So life and death is really real. So the salvation for every soul was a matter of life and death to you and me. I think many in our family still do not know the Lord. Your neighbours, your friends, your close relatives, right? Many of them still do not know the Lord. But you know the Lord. What, what kind of sense of urgency that you have in, in you yourself? We must take this gospel, this evangelism, seriously with utmost urgency. Why? Because life and death, it is a fine line. Number four, the danger of doing nothing. The facts about Titanic. Various Titanic passengers testified about people who died because they were convinced Nothing can be done to save them. 
they lay there crying till the waters was over their heads. Uh, they just prayed and yelled and never even lift a hand to help themselves. They had lost their own willpower and expected God to do all their work for them. And as a result, many died that night. So what can we learn again from the sinking of the Titanic? Many people today likewise believe there's nothing they need to do to be saved. They believe that God will do all the work for them. There is nothing to do except believe in God and pray the sinner's prayer. It is true. We cannot even earn our salvation and nothing we do could ever save us if Jesus had not died and made salvation possible for you and me. By dying, he gave us the opportunity to be saved. But in order for us to receive his forgiveness, he requires us to obey him. We need to put works into action. Don't only say, don't only read the Bible, but put what God has taught us into action. You know, that's why obedience is so important. Obedience always results in action. You and me need to put God's word into action. You know? <clears throat> Romans 10, 9 and 10 say, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes, right? And is justified. And with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So, by knowing Romans 10, 9 and 10 itself, if you do not confess with your mouth, you will not be saved. By knowing this verse itself, you need to put those verses into action. You must believe in your heart and then you must confess with your, with your mouth. Then only it is kira. Then only it is counted. You, know, you must speak it out. You know. Matthew seven twenty one says that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of the Father in heaven. And Hebrews 5.9 says, Jesus became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Philippians 2.12 says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Huh? As believers, we need to trust and obey. The trust is in believing that God is able and obey in following after Christ's servanthood. He was our example. We cannot be a passive Christians anymore. Brothers and sisters, hear me out. We can no longer be a passive Christian. I pray that today as we examine our walk with God, we get our priorities right. Remember the four lessons just now I've shared with you? Number one, the futility of wealth. Let us never trust our riches. Yes, God is good. He has blessed many of us in so many ways. I'm blessed. My children are blessed. My father are blessed. Many of my family are blessed. My, my, my relatives are blessed. But let us never forget who is the source of our blessing. Huh? And remember what I've shared with you earlier. Do not hoard your riches. Do not hoard your wealth. Share with those people who need it. And number two, the danger of overconfidence. Pride always goes before a fall. God has given us talent and abilities that we should always be reliant on Him. And never for a moment think uh, that we can go through life without Him. And number three, the fine line between life and and death. We should never live our life carelessly. Huh? Life is fleeting, you know, fleeting. It's just just like that. All of us cannot know when is our last day here before we go home. So let us live our life responsibly. <coughs> and the last point is the danger of doing nothing. We should always work while it is yet day. And that's what the Bible says. Uh, as much as we are reliant on God, right? We should not just sit still. We still need to put our hands on the plow and work. We are reminded of our Lord Jesus Christ who gave us a great commission before he ascended to heaven. You know, what did Jesus say? If you were to meet Jesus today, uh, if you were to meet him face to face, uh, Jesus said, did you do what I asked you to do? You know, did you do what I asked you to do? And if you are perplexed and you do not have the answer, that means something is wrong. So reflect back on the Great Commission. What did Jesus say to us before he went up to heaven? It was in Matthew 28. I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go. Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach this new disciple to obey all the commands that I have given you. And be sure of this, I will be with you always, even to the end of age. 
This is the commitment that Jesus said he will do for you, but you must obey what he asks you to do. I pray this simple incident in history uh, will help us draw some perspective on our own lives. Spend the next few moments uh, to reflect on your own life. <clears throat> At this point in time of your life, in your walk with our Lord, where are you? Are you busy making money and neglecting the things of God? Are you so preoccupied with yourself that God is at the least, do you have any unsafe loved ones in your household that is not safe? What did you do about it? The Bible promised that when one in the household is safe, right, the rest will be safe too. But we need to obey and act upon it. We do not know how much time that we have left on earth. But if you and I do our part, we can bring many into the kingdom of God. So if you receive God's message today from the four points that I've shared with you, can you please say amen to that? Hmm? And before I, want, before I end this session, I want to give you the opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of your lives. Would you pray with me? Just say a simple prayer. Lord Jesus, forgive me for the sin I've done, I've committed. I repented of my sin. I want to, you, Lord Jesus, to come into my heart. I want to make you, Jesus, my Lord and my Savior. If you have said that prayer, if you have said that prayer, <coughs> believe that you are born again. So get yourself to a good Bible-based church. You know, keep God first in your heart and in your action, and He's going to change your life. So I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to what I've shared, and I want you to be reminded that our time on earth is very limited. If you and I do our part, I think at the end of the day, when we stand before God, God will ask you, what have you done what I asked you to do? And if your answer is yes, then you have done a good job. So with that, I thank you and I shalom. <laughs>